the person who tongues at the teeth ta 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 will have a harder articulation and use more tongue and it's less tongue that will help us have a much lighter tongue but I hope you understand as far as tongue placement goes that we tongue away from the teeth at the point where the teeth go into the gum line now let me mention something which I faithfully use with my own students that is the use of soft attacks one of my biggest bugs is the person who hammers his attack now there is nothing in music that starts off with this smack unless it's for strictly effect purposes yet we'll have people youngsters oldsters everybody that'll pick up their horn and they'll go do you not have students right now band vectors that this is how their attack starts with this wham on it now we must get away from that the actual attack is the ugliest part of our sounds and the less tongue that we can use the more pure sound we actually have and I believe an effective way to get away from using so much tongue is to work on soft attacks right at the point where sound just doesn't quite make it that you actually lose the sound right at this level now all this is doing is disciplining that tongue to come off the teeth very easily it's more of a psychological approach than anything else of disciplining the tongue and is not our entire training process disciplining us to react a certain way this is why we use scales to discipline the fingers to move rhythmically precise and to respond a certain pattern in all of our practicing of getting ourselves to react to certain circumstances now here we are with this soft attack disciplining the tongue to move ever so gently off the teeth and as you work on this the tongue will get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter to the point that you can say to yourself if I can start a sound with this less tongue is there any reason at all I should ever tongue any harder because where does volume of sound come from does it come from the tongue no it comes from the air the intensity that we put behind it now you will use a stronger tongue as you get louder but not to the point then of an explosion so that in working on soft attacks we are disciplining the tongue to move easily off of the teeth and telling us that I don't have to use this heavy tongue to start a note why should I use it then now can you see a couple other elements here that are being developed by using soft attacks control can you see how this would just really help your control that if you can pick up your horn and the note responds that the next time the band vector comes in on the second movement of something right there it is because the students have developed this control that they don't come in with a duh because they had to use this heaviness to get it started then they can go soft because the hardest part is getting that sound going but this is working on control if you work on soft attacks you're working on control here's the element maybe that you hadn't thought about if a student comes in to me and he has a relatively sluggish tongue I say let's work on soft attacks you want to learn how to tongue fast the first thing they do is work on soft attacks they don't see the relationship right away but what is a sluggish tongue a slow tongue it's the tongue that not only is hitting too hard right but also the tongue that is moving too far the rebound is of a greater distance when you work on soft attacks how far does that tongue actually move it moves just a small amount doesn't it oh. 
It just barely moves off of the teeth, so that the distance then to get back to the teeth is smaller. And therefore, we have a faster tongue, because we are disciplining the tongue to move a smaller distance, a lesser distance, off the teeth, back, and then back to the teeth again. So soft attacks can help us out greatly. And I am almost assured that this is one element that you brass people haven't spent much time at, that you haven't worked much on soft attacks. But it will help. It'll help your control. It'll help the rapidness of your tongue. It's an element that should be covered in our fundamental warming up and preparatory exercises before we actually get into the literature of our practicing period. So work on some soft attacks. It's a necessity for us as brass players. The next thing that I would like to cover is flexibility. One thing that a brass player definitely needs is flexibility. How many baritone players are here today? Good, good. Now, how many of you people have played this little solo and it has come out like this? Is this not one of the hardest things to perform? You're all out of breath and your lip is stiff, so to get this response from that F down to the B flat is one of the hardest things to do. But the main problem is flexibility of being able to go from one open slur to another one easily. So in my teaching, I use a set of lip slurs which was given to me by my teacher, which more than likely was given to him by his teacher. And if any portion of this various set of lip slurs will help you, then go ahead and use them. Any brass player can make up their own. The pattern is unimportant. But the fact that we must work on lip slurs is important. For flexibility, going back to gauging error, as you do a set pattern, you have to drive stronger at the end of a phrase, at the end of the lip slur, more so than at the beginning. Now let me run through the set that I use. This is the pattern that I use and the pattern that I teach to my students. Starting out in the middle range, at the very middle part of your register, and working to the extreme ranges of the horn in lip slurs. So on down to two and three, one and three, one, two and three. And then the second set, after the student begins to get quite flexible on this particular lip slur, then I'll go into the next one. After this one begins to get quite smooth for the student. I stick in an octave. Now, all the time that I work with slipsters with the students, one thing I keep in constant demand of the student. The breath line itself is just one steady, straight stream of air with this crescendo I mentioned about gauging the air, that you have to push, push, push. All right, then I go into an octave lip slur. <laughs> All the way down again to one, two, and three. Then after this one is smooth. Once again, going all the way down to one, two, and three. And then usually the final stage of the lip slur beam. And 
then after you've completely covered those, then you can pick up your horn and... The B-flat will be responsive for you. Simply because your lip will feel easy. Your lip will feel relaxed. It won't be tight. And you will have a real command. So this is another element of all brass playing. Whether you're a trumpet player, whether you're a trombone player, that you establish a set of lip slurs that you cover. Just like you cover your major scales. Just like you cover your minor scales. Just like you cover your thirds. It's another element of development that we must use. I'd like to toss in something here. Did you notice that my head did not move too much in doing the lip slurs? That I really wasn't doing much of a pivot? Do you know what I mean by pivot? That as we go up, for the upper register, we either bring the head forward and up, or some persons do it the other way around. But usually most persons have to raise the head and push the jaw forward by moving the head or bringing the horn down as they go up, similar to this. You see how the horn is moving and the head is moving? Now this is a pivot system. As you go up, more pressure is applied to the lower jaw by bringing the lower jaw closer to the mouthpiece by raising the head or bringing the horn down. Also, what happens to the breath line as you raise the head forward? The breath line climbs up in the mouthpiece so that you are directing that air more to the center and the upper part of the mouthpiece the higher you go. Now, I use a system of jaw motion. The higher I go, my lower jaw comes forward as well as up, but it comes forward. I'll use this and see if you can't see my jaw moving forward. See my jaw moving there? The higher I go, I push my lower jaw forward and up. Now let's compare the two. As I raise my head up, I place more pressure against the mouthpiece, my lower jaw. As I push my lower jaw forward, keeping my head straight and steady, am I not also applying more pressure with the lower jaw against the mouthpiece? Now I use the word pressure, not extensive pressure. I'm not talking about the pressure to the upper lip of jamming it in. I'm not talking about this. But the higher we go of beginning to equalize the pressure between the upper jaw and the lower jaw. So in essence, both are doing the same thing. Whether you move the head or push the jaw forward, both of them are putting more pressure to the lower jaw. Also, and try this, with your jaw in a normal position, blowing that air directed downward, as we talked about in forming the embouchure, what happens to your breath line? Does not the breath rise? So once again, whether it is a pivot system or just strictly the jaw motion, we are basically doing the same thing. I prefer the use of the jaw. If a person is having trouble in the upper register, he knows that his embouchure is right. He knows that he is using the breath correctly. Everything is working well for him. Try the pivot or the jaw and see how this works out with your own development. Helping you get into the upper register and then helping you also get into the lower register by working in reverse of the jaw coming back and down for this low register. And when you get into the low register, here usually the jaw will not be enough and you do have to go over to a pivot point so that the lower register does respond for you. But most brass players definitely have to use either a pivot system or utilizing the jaw. Now, let me bring something else up. You've heard me play a few sounds here today. And basically, with the sounds, you have heard a vibrato. And I want to mention this because the vibrato I use is a little different than what most brass players utilize. Most brass players are using the jaw vibrato, basically for euphonium, for trombone, for tuba, the jaw vibrato is the most widely accepted and used. However, the vibrato that I use is a breath vibrato. The same vibrato that a flutist uses, the same vibrato that an oboist uses, 
the same vibrato that if any of you do any singing that you already have. It's this natural vibrato stemming from the breath line. Now, I teach my students the jaw because it's the most widely used and accepted. After they have learned the jaw vibrato, then if they wish and are inquisitive enough, we go into the breath vibrato. Whichever one you use, do it slowly. Don't rush. Do it slowly. Very, very slowly. Let me go through the jaw vibrato with you. Show you the extreme that I think must be done as far as getting the jaw moving. We'll start out and we'll have the jaw move this far. Of really letting that jaw come down and open up. Getting a very ugly sound when it is open. But disciplining us to get it open, to get the jaw moving and not scared to move the jaw. After a week of working on this type of work, then we might move up. A little quicker, and you notice a little narrower. Not quite as wide as before. And as we develop this vibrato, the faster it becomes is where we narrow it down. The next step would be... <laughs> Clicking the metronome up a little quicker. After a couple months or so, this would be in working toward the jaw vibrato. The breath vibrato, very similar, except we start out slowly by accenting with the breath line at regular pulsations of using the breath. quicker. And right about that speed, all of a sudden, you'll notice that an involuntary throat muscle will be reacting and doing most of the work for you. It started out down here at the stomach line, but the faster it goes, it comes up and is all of a sudden beginning to be controlled through an involuntary throat muscle. The next step then, you'll really begin to feel it in the throat. Very little motion then, the faster you go, down in the stomach line. hardly feel it at all here in the throat. Don't get the feeling that you should really feel something working for you here in the throat. You won't. And then finally, this being the breath vibrato. In either extent, whether it's the jaw or the breath, you start slowly and you work up and you speed up gradually, that it does move slow enough that it will be done correctly.
Now, when do you start the vibrato? Not until a person can pick up his horn and play one straight, steady sound. I have students right now who play well, but I wouldn't dare give them a vibrato because their sound hasn't leveled out yet. Their muscles just aren't strong enough. It's not a real, steady, pure, straight sound. But once you can get this steady, open, clear sound, then work with a vibrato. To finish up, let me get into the practice period itself. Now, practicing, we know. It's accepted. No clinician has to stand up here and say, I practice four hours a day. That means you should practice four hours a day. We all understand that practicing is just a necessity. Anything that I say, anything that any clinician says, is strictly speaking of the physical characteristics of getting things basically correct. You have to take it from there. You have to go out and you have to set in the practice room. You are the one that has to develop it further. You are the one that then has to become a musician with the fundamentals of the right approach and of working on the instrument. We say that in school work we have the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. In practicing our horns, people, we have the three M's. We have a metronome. We have a mirror and the music. We need a metronome because what is one thing that all of us have trouble with? Because we're human. Because we are not a machine, but rhythm. We have trouble with rhythm, so we need a metronome. It's a necessity that we get a metronome and that we faithfully use a metronome. We need a mirror. Why do we need a mirror? Because we cannot really feel what happens with the embouchure. Too many times, as a student progresses, especially into the upper register, they begin to smile just for the sake of getting the notes. You need something visual that you can use to check your embouchure, of looking in that mirror, of checking the embouchure, checking how much pressure you are using, and to check the placement of it. And then, of course, music, that you have the books which are the method books for your particular instrument, that every brass player has an Arvin's book, getting those scales, getting those arpeggios, developing these fundamentals, which are so necessary for developing a response. Your repertoire is graded for your performance. As you develop, the solos also develop, because the constant development of your ability, your qualities as a musician, is dependent upon the literature that you use. So in your practicing, three ends, metronome, mirror, and the music. Basically, this is what I wanted to cover with you today, what I think are just basic fundamentals. There are many things I know which I have completely forgotten, completely left out. But basically, these fundamentals will help you as much as any set of fundamentals some of them I expect you to certainly try. Some of them I know that you won't try. But nonetheless, evaluate what you've heard. Constant evaluation is the mark of a master teacher, the teacher that is able to constantly improve by taking what he has done, what he has said, the techniques he uses, evaluate them, throw some away, keep some. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.